you would never usually need to carry 400 pounds on your back in normal everyday life, but trying that makes you stronger, gives you experience of what it's like to have to deal with a problem like that. And I think we are very willing for some reason to take those risks in certain contexts, but especially in these interpersonal contexts, it's it's scarier and you feel more vulnerable. But I feel like that's that's why those are the places that you should be taking those risks. Welcome to the Art of Coaching Podcast, a show aimed at getting to the core of what it takes to change attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes in the weight room, boardroom, classroom, and everywhere in between. I'm your host, Brett Bartholomew. I'm a performance coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the book, Conscious Coaching. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student interested in all aspects of human behavior and communication. I wanna thank you for joining me, and now let's dive into today's episode. Legendary screenwriter Robert McKee once said, the art of story is the dominant cultural force in the world. He could not have been more correct. And whether you're a coach, a writer, a manager, or a filmmaker, chances are that at some point you were taught a lesson and one that stuck with you through the medium of storytelling. Quality storytelling is without a doubt transformative. It has a way of sticking to our ribs and reminding us of who we are and what we value. It's the bedrock of connecting with others. And also, as I've found personally, it helps us understand how to overcome our own problems. And today I'm interviewing a master storyteller in his own right, Michael Tucker. Michael is a filmmaker and a writer living in Los Angeles. He's the creator of the film analysis YouTube channel, Lessons from the Screenplay which reaches over 1.3 million people. He's also the host of the podcast Beyond the Screenplay and the creator of a new video series examining storytelling in video games called Story Mode. He is a self-proclaimed diehard David Fincher fan and thinks the pur- that purple is the best lightsaber color. But here's the thing, guys. As he soon came to find out, He's also been one of the most inspiring forces in my life over the last year and a half, and I mean that candidly. This is because his work has helped me realize that nearly every problem I face as a person, as a coach, as a business owner, was a story in and of itself, all with their own plots, character arcs, ways of looking at problems, and being able to find creative resolutions. And this, what you're about to hear, is a recording of our actual first time meeting one another. I reached out to him, just a cold reach out, and and told him what his work has meant to me. And similarly, he was very surprised to learn how I viewed storytelling to be very much related to coaching and the constraints that we help others overcome in their own journeys. So sit back and enjoy this episode of seeing two seemingly disparate worlds collide into what has easily been one of my favorite conversations to date. And by the way, if you find yourself inspired by Michael's journey in any way, specifically at how he's crafted a unique niche for himself that's allowed him to create a values-driven business that impacts a ton of people all by doing what he loves most, be sure to go to artofcoaching.com forward slash blind spot. That's artofcoaching.com forward slash blind spot to learn more about a new resource we have coming out this Wednesday that can help you do the same. Trust me, you do not want to miss it. All right, folks, Michael Tucker. Michael Tucker, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, now I, I like giving the audience a behind the scenes understanding of, of context. And uh, guys, if you're listening in, this is the first time Michael and I have ever spoken. And I'll be straightforward, been a fan of this guy for a long time and everything he does with his organization, Lessons from the Screenplay. And I just cold reached out to him. I believe it was on Twitter, wasn't it, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, I 
there's always preconceived notions we have in human interaction. And so I always wonder, all right, how do we, how do we approach this? Because if Michael looks at my profile, he may see, all right, well, this guy looks like a coach. I'm into filmmaking and cinema, you know, what is this really going to be like? And, uh, you know, there's plenty of people that just don't respond or they don't even give it a chance. You were very warm and welcoming. So I just want to share my appreciation of you trusting a stranger and jumping onto a show that could seem out of context for you. Oh, well, yeah, thank you, of course. And and I, I feel like it helps that, you know, I do get approached by some people and they're, you can pretty quickly, I think, parse out, well, this person's maybe a little crazy or this person is just has this kind of weird notion of what they want. But uh, you were very professional and generous in the way you reached out and talked about everything. So I, I felt immediately like, oh, this is a, a person that is worth talking to for sure. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. And guys, for more context, one thing Michael and I were talking about prior to jumping in and we're going to focus on is, you know, what drew me to Michael's work is how he approaches focused and effective storytelling. And so you guys are going to hear me plug it again and again and again. But if you haven't checked out his YouTube channel, Lessons from the Screenplay, uh, you need to. But what I told Michael is, listen, I'm in the realm of coaching. And in coaching, there are many different characters there are many different conflicts and there are many similar story arcs. We're all trying to take somebody from one point, navigating a variety of obstacles to get them to another point, what they want or what they need to achieve. So it was organic. You know, I have to ask though, Michael, when, when you think of what you do and what you examine prior to speaking with me, even just shortly before the episode, would you have ever contextualized coaching in a similar manner in that way? I probably that probably wouldn't have been my first thought. No, I, I, I do appreciate that. You know what I love about storytelling uh, when it's done well, is that it, it is accessing human psychology and just the way that we perceive the world and interact with the world and the way we live. We kind of think of ourselves as the protagonists in stories a, a lot of the time. And so the idea behind storytelling does pop up everywhere but because it is just how humans see the world and you know cycles of growth and death and renewal and all that stuff is everywhere and that's why good storytelling is powerful so i it would not have been my first thought but once you explained it i was like oh that makes complete sense of course yeah and and it's something that i want to guys if you're listening i want to inculcate really early you know, there's a lot of times within coaching circles or leadership in general where we think books are where we need to go. We're, and, and books are great. We don't need to sit here and talk about why everybody should read books. But we often issue film. And you'll hear people say, well, I don't own a TV or your bookshelf should be twice as big as your TV. And I don't go to the movies. And this was something, Michael, that I heard a lot when I started off in coaching. I mean, it, it was almost mm -hmm. this fervor of you need to read a book a week. And if you're watching TV, it's wasting time. And everything you do, I mean, just and unintentionally, of course, spits in the face of that because of the depth <laughs> that you dive into film and you show that, hey, you no, know, people don't just, stuff doesn't pop up, right? These are screenplays. <laughs> There's a lot of nuance that goes into it. What, what made you dive into this world of, of screenplays and, and dissection and understanding psychology as storytelling to many degrees, if you don't mind sharing that with us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've loved movies since I was a kid, um, just because they were fun. And, you know, I loved Star Wars. I loved Indiana Jones, you know, all the things that get kids excited about it. And um, it, as a kid, I wanted to like do visual effects and blow up spaceships and, and all that stuff. And as I got older, I started to, um, you know, watching the behind the scenes that come with DVDs and, and hearing more about the filmmaking process, I started to appreciate the role of the storyteller and the reason that people get excited during these action scenes is because there is this emotional connection or it's affecting them in this psychological way. Um, and so as I got older, I just found that side of things much more um, interesting and intriguing. And the idea that, you know, film kind of all storytelling is essentially manipulation, but manipulation for good ideally and you know to help people grow and to teach lessons and and themes and so i think um as i spent more time investigating that i just was really excited to be able um, to have that power to to make other people happy or teach them like a better way to live or impart lessons that i had learned in life um and so it, there was kind of, as far as like my personal journey with filmmaking, 
Uh, especially when I was in college, I was very focused on the directing side of things. And, you know, it's easy to get excited about the technical aspects of filmmaking. And I want this new camera and, you know, this shoots in HD. And with this lens, I'll be able to do this shot. And it's uh, easy, I think, especially when you're younger, to get excited about the toys aspect of film. And so a lot of my focus when younger was on that. And then after moving to LA and kind of trying to make it in the industry, I would, uh, you know, the work that I made was technically impressive and it would get me into the room. And then people would kind of say, cool, so what's your story? Where's your screenplay? And then they'd read it and be like, well, the writing isn't up to par with the directing, the technical aspects of stuff. And so after kind of running into that wall over and over again, I realized, oh, this is a weakness that I have is the fundamentals of storytelling. That was the stuff that I wasn't paying attention to in college when I was learning about filmmaking. So why don't I put aside the things that I already feel pretty good at and tackle this weakness, this lack that I have, and just go hard on it and try to see if I can up that that part of it. And that's kind of where Lessons from Screenplay uh, came from. No, and there's a deep appreciation for that too, as you and I continue to get to know one another. And this is why we do the show as a conversation, not just like a question, question, question is, uh, mm -hmm. you see that very much in, in the core field that I started out with in, in strength and conditioning. There's a fascination with the training aspects of it, right? Like it's, if it's not the exercises, now it's the sports science. What, what data can we get to show how fast an athlete's running? And now they're jumping in what happened. But what we saw is so many people gravitating away from exploring the coaching, you know, and if they did talk about the coaching side of it, uh, it was a very transformational rah, rah, you know, probably like a really bad, uh, eighties hero movie, you know? And <laughs> so what you had is these coaches who hadn't really explored their own identity or just felt like, well, you know, and I'm sure this is in filmmaking as well, but feel free to correct me. We see certain coaches that, you know, they kind of mimic other coaches, which, you know, that's part of the journey. I get it. You're going to take inspiration, right? Or they sure. tend to coach how they were coached. Um, but there's this whole other world. And it sounds like where, where you've evolved, where, you know, some coaches still struggle is there's still a fascination in coaching with the technical side because people feel relatively comfortable hiding there where let's think about interpersonal skills or psychology. If somebody says you're, you're, well, you need to improve on your communication or your coaching. It's easy to take that personally. Um, it, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, you said in, in a previous interview that your dad used to edit movies, uh, as well. And, but your mom wanted you to be a doctor. So in terms of nature <laughs> nurture, where did that, how did you navigate that conflict? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, luckily, both of my parents were very supportive of everything. My mom, you know, definitely hoped I would go that route because that's, you know, she was a nurse and had wanted to be a doctor. But when she was growing up, that was harder for women to get into. So I think, you know, there's there's probably just everyone kind of hopes that their child will be interested in things that they are and be able to share that. Um, but, yeah, it was pretty clear early on that the movie side of things was uh, where 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 my interests lay um but it, it and then part of that i think my dad was also really fascinated by the toys and the cameras and stuff and and i think like you're saying it's it's 100 percent true in filmmaking and i think as a creative person and you know it's kind of like a we have these labels where it's like creatives are this kind of person they make art but i, I feel like as you're saying all these things overlap um but it, it is a lot easier to deal with these kind of technical um, toy things and like data and stats like you're talking about. Like that's <clears throat> it's easier to interact with it because it's an external objective thing that can be measured and compared and stuff. But the deeper work that's required um, is scary and is hard if you want to be a really good storyteller or it sounds like a really good coach and like you're saying these interpersonal skills it requires acknowledging your like personal like flaws or weaknesses or fears or just le letting yourself be vulnerable and that's hard and scary and also there it's so there's a lot less resources out there for people that, you know, if you say, and this is kind of, again, why I wanted to create lessons from the screenplay, because when I realized, okay, my writing isn't 
good enough? How do I get better? Like I'm, I'm willing to admit that I have this weakness, but how do I improve? There aren't a lot of resources out there built around helping people get better at those things. Cause it is this kind of, it's a harder mountain to climb in some ways. Um, and so I think that's, I think that is starting to change. And that's kind of what I was hoping to do with lessons from the screenplay is like make these story fundamentals that can be off putting more accessible to people. And it sounds like that's what you're doing with art of coaching also is making, giving people a resource where it's like, it's okay to come and talk about these things and learn and get better at all of this. A hundred percent. Right. And, and focusing on you for a moment uh, and, and then bridging back into that because there's some common themes there. Uh, and there's going to be kind of a brief question, but I wanted to bridge into something else. Now I know from a creativity standpoint, I, I just had my, my first child. So right now it's, he's an only child. You're an only child, right? And you said once that you feel like that helped you foster some sense of creativity. Uh, yeah, I, I have a half brother, but basically I, I was raised as an only child essentially. Um, but I, I, I think I kind of thrived in that environment. I think it let me rely on imagination a lot. And so I had a very active imagination as a child and enjoyed playing and creating stories and, um, you know, taking my dad's video camera and taking my toys and making little movies that was basically just me recreating, you know, Toy Story or Jurassic Park with my toys. Um, but yeah, I, I personally felt I had kind of no problem just being on my own and creating stories out of thin air just with my imagination. Yeah, no. And, and I think that uh, is particularly fascinating because, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times, well, there are certain aspects of, of your craft that came easy and others that you had to learn to develop, you know, beyond the technical side. I mean, you, I want to give the audience uh, uh, an understanding, you know, at the time of this recording, lessons from the screenplay, you manage 1.3 million subscribers, right? And then you have a team that I believe you said uh, you have five people on your team or six. Uh uh, six, including me. Right. And then you have a podcast and you have many other outputs and, and many other things you do. Uh, from that standpoint, you know, I wonder how, how much have you even continued to expand beyond not only the technical skills of your craft, but examining the other storytelling skills, but now the leadership skills within your organization and also how you communicate what you guys are doing uh, with lessons from the screenplay and story mode. You know, that's another level up. So how, how have you <laughs> continued to find both challenge, uh, maybe a little bit of fear and excitement in that at the same time. Yeah. I mean, so the, the choice to move from continuing to do lessons from screenplay is basically an entirely a, a solo job. Um, there was like, there's one person that, uh, Vince major, who's kind of like my producer, like helps me run things and kind of just keeps me sane. And he's been there since the beginning. Um, but otherwise, lessons from the screenplay the first two years was just me making all the videos. And so the decision to bring in a team was very scary because I think as a, as a creator and as someone with my personality type, like I tend to be perfectionistic. I tend to like to have control over everything and in bringing in a team that's necessarily letting go of control, which is scary. Um, but it's also really rewarding. And I think one of the things I like about filmmaking is when you're making a movie, it's a highly collaborative process. Um, you know, the writing sometimes is a solo venture, but when you're on set, you're working with actors, you're working with DPs, you're working with the crew, and that continues into the post-production where there's editors and the sound mixers and the composer. And uh, that's all really fun and I enjoy being like director and kind of being the leader in that role. And so I kind of expected to be uh, for some of those skills to translate into like management of like a team and this, this other uh, format of creating YouTube videos. And what I found is that it's very different than directing a movie. And so I was kind of unexpectedly, uh, unexpectedly found myself very challenged with trying to manage a team and all these things that you, you brought up with coaching of like this, the interpersonal relationships and wanting to make sure that everyone gets a chance to play and put their best self forward. But you also have to weigh 
personalities and relationships against the quality of the work that's being produced and how how much control do you try to maintain and if you're holding on too tightly is that not giving people a chance to learn and do their best work but if they don't make it then is that like hurting your brand so there's there's just a lot of things to juggle that I wasn't um super prepared for and so it's been a uh, definitely a challenge and a very good learning experience and uh it's what I think the one thing that I did do was pick people that are all awesome good people so even when we've had our uh challenges they've been very supportive and down and very helpful so 100% credit to them for being awesome um but it, it was interesting to go into something thinking that I had a good set of leadership skills because of you know I know how to run a set on on when making a film but managing people and more of a company structure was completely different and definitely a, a new kind of challenge yeah it's uh, to that point I think you made it well you know very well is we tend to assume if we're good at certain things or even similar things that it just transcends and in some cases that that is true right like we know that even whether it's it's some of the best films or or books or what have you, they pull inspiration from a wide variety of ideas, and and the more varied that individual's perspective, generally, the better they're able to tie together common themes, even the ones that don't seem relevant at at one point. Uh, like it's it's it is tricky though, right? Managing people, and like you said, uh, there's sometimes where you know you hear in leadership and life in general we have to be empathetic and we have to give people a chance but you had mentioned sometimes you you still have to be mindful is what I'm is what's going to happen from somebody else or the work they produce going to hurt my brand you know and you think about this in in sport you know there's nothing compassionate if a pitcher is getting shelled in the ninth inning of leaving him in there because he thinks he can do it uh, there's a point where it's compassionate to be like yo it's not your night or or this isn't a fit um, and you got to know when to do that as as any kind of leader whatsoever has your perfectionistic yet. Uh, well, you didn't use it. Would you describe yourself as a, and of course it's contextual introvert or extrovert, but for the most part, where would you feel like you lie? Definitely more toward the introverted side. Like I, I, I do com completely fine when on my own for, for the most part. Okay. So um, hypothetically, but, let's say I was on your team and I, you know, and I have a background in, in, in a similar space, right? Of course. So let's, let's imagine that. And I've just done a crap job with something. And you know, you, you, you know that I'm a value driven person, you know me as a person, but I've done a crap job. What's the first thought that goes through your head when you're like, all right, I have got to find a way to address this head on. This is borderline scary and could tank the uh, brand. What goes through your head right then? Let's do a little improv on that note. <laughs> uh yeah i'm i'm suddenly paralyzed with stress uh well i, I mean I, so i think what's i think one of the things about my personality that is a strength that can also be a weakness is that i i think i do have a lot of empathy and can step into other people's shoes so i can i feel like i immediately understand the objective situation and what needs to be done but i'm also then immediately considering you know what how are you going to feel about it and what is best for you and our relationship? And is there a way to, I feel like I immediately start trying to balance and juggle those things of like the end product needs to be good that we can't sacrifice that, but what's the best way to navigate this so that there's the, the best opportunity for us to have a relationship moving forward and for the next project to be even better and so I think that's, and sometimes that's kind of impossible to reconcile and that's where it can, I can end up kind of frozen and hard to know what to do. Um, but I feel like that's, that tends to be how I look at those situations is zooming out. What are the objective goals, but also what are the interpersonal things and like long-term, like not just fixing the situation, but if I go too hard on trying to fix this one situation, is that going to have negative repercussions down the line? Sure. It's funny, it doesn't sound all that dissimilar from your breakdown of arrival, right? Where we look at various mm -hmm. forms of conflict in certain ways and we tend to make uh, moments into monsters and you can think about what is the, what's the person, what's the situation, what's my interpretation of this thing, where's the threat, um, is, is everything 
am I actually seeing what I think I'm seeing? But I remember that you helped me get over a creative hump, whether you know it or not, with your breakdown of that film. I was looking at something in particular that was going on with our organization as we were trying to grow. And I remember just uh, the way you broke that down immediately, something popped into my head and I'm like, okay, like I've got to change. I've got to change this and make sure people understand that this is a, a, a non zero sum game, right? Because sometimes mm. people have this interpretation that that's what that is. And, uh, that, that film breakdown in particular was especially impactful for me for that reason. Cause that was a big part of that film, right? Like it, it's a non zero sum game, but we tend to look at everything a little bit different than that. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things I love about that movie is that, you know, it's a, it's a movie where aliens land and then basically do nothing and the humans just out of their fear of what could happen cause all these problems and almost end up like starting a nuclear war basically. And I just think that the themes there are so powerful and, and really resonate with me of, you know, when we react emotionally and don't take the time to kind of step back and not give into impulses. Um, it can, we can often take behaviors that's actually uh, like bad for us. And so I think that's something that I try to um, keep in mind in life in general. And I think is what is um, trying to yeah, you're fine. be somewhat hum- humble about this. No, but don't be. I think be, that's, say what you want to <laughs> I think say. that's one of the things that's, that is good about lessons from the screenplay and how I approach analysis of a film is like, you know, there's the emotional reaction that you can have when you're watching something and it's cool to talk about the emotions and how it made you feel and whether you like this or whether you don't like that's all fine but what i try to do is say okay this is how i feel and then let's take a step back like let's put that aside take a step back and say okay what is it in here that's making me feel that way and in film that's useful because it's just it's you know revealing the parts and the structure of storytelling and so you can if you remove yourself from that experience of watching, then you can look more objectively and say, oh, well, this character saying this plugs into the character arc. And because I know what they really mean by that, I understand the emotional power when they do this or whatever it is. Um, And I think in life, that's also just useful. And I think that's, I tend to be a very patient person because I have kind of trained myself to, you know, when something happens, there's how I feel about it. I'm going to acknowledge that I feel that way, put that on pause, and then zoom out and look at this situation objectively and say, what's actually going on here? And then I can make a decision based on that more rational appraisal of things. And so that it takes a lot of energy and is really hard to do a lot of the time. But I think that's um, something that I, I think is is useful and that I wish there was... Um, that it was easier to arrive at in our culture because it's it's hard. Yeah, well, a lot of that has to do with how we tend to perceive and internalize failure, right? Which is interesting and mm, threat yeah. and what have you. I'm glad that you you kind of gave a, a brief synopsis and in, in a charmingly simplified way of saying, yeah, it's about these aliens that land and do nothing. And then you kind of talked about <laughs> the conflict that created. You see the same thing. And I, I tell you this as we continue to get to know one another and you see the synergy here, hopefully, so you understand the bigger impact your work has. At Art of Coaching, you know, a lot of the times when people reach out to me, they may say, hey, this individual I work with or somebody that I'm training or what have you, it could be an athlete, it could be a corporate exec, uh, I can't get buy-in or they're stubborn or something's going on here, there's a conflict. And, and you know, they want to tell me about all the traits and attributes of this individual, right? They kind of, and in my book, I talk about 16 archetypes and, and you understand obviously mm-hmm. better than most the concept of archetypes they exist in film ubiquitously. Mm-hmm. And they make it very much about this person. And I always try to tell them like, yeah, okay, well, like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I gave Mm -hmm. him the research or I told her this. I'm like, all right, well, it sounds like you're trying to like influence them through rational persuasion, or you're trying to compel them to do something through giving them some inspirational kind of, uh, uh, communicative act. But like, how do you know that that's what they, how they perceive it? And well, it doesn't matter. And, and we got to do this. I'm like, but it does, right? Like the, the context, the settings matter. Like think of all the films that people don't see because they hear about something from a friend or I didn't like this and I didn't like that or the storyline sounds, uh, you know, violent or, or something like that. And it's like, no, no. But in the context of that world, if you just take a deeper look at the exposition and how it's conveyed, 
It's not, it's not that at all. I mean, I remember my mom, you know, for a long time, whether we looked at superhero movies like that, well, I'm not going to see this. And mm. I go, mom, and I get it. Mm. And I hate to use the example of superhuman, uh, superhero movies, but even you do a great job of breaking down. Like, yeah, I mean, listen, there's really good examples of, of character arcs. You looked at Tony Stark and Captain, and I think when people mm -hmm. can see the conflict of their own lives manifested in film, if they're actually paying attention, they'd regard it very differently they'd regard it very mm -hmm. differently. Does that make sense? Or is that like just nonsense yeah. what I said? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's funny that you, because my mom also was not really in the superhero train and, and kind of when COVID started and everybody was locked down, she needed something to do. And she was like, I guess I'll start watching these Marvel movies. And then she got hooked and watched all of them because giving them a chance, she was able to find, you know, the whatever you might think of them on the surface, if you do look deeply, there is really important like storytelling and, and psychological things in there. And yeah, I, I think what you're talking about is really important as, as a creative person also, because that's obviously where I, I come from with this. And um, so like I, I have a, a creative partner, uh, Alex Cairos, who's on the Lessons from the Screenplay team. He's on our podcast, Beyond the Screenplay. And he and I have worked together since college when we kind of both discovered that we were both equally ambitious and excited about film in the same way. We just started working together and have worked together ever since. And over time, I've worked more and more closely as like co-directors and co-writers. And uh, that journey has had a lot of ups and downs that have been very instructive and helpful for me as a just as a creator myself, because it's made me have to challenge my preconceived notions and my ego. And I think that is a really important part I've found anyway to become, um, to, to allow yourself to be a creative person that is willing to grow and learn. I think you have to kind of exactly what you were saying with these people and dealing with the, the different archetypes and they're trying to explain to somebody else, well, this is how I see it. So you should see it this way and using the techniques that work for you to try to convey to somebody else it is helpful to almost like assume you're wrong like take a moment or at least that's what I try to do it's like when I'm stuck on something and I feel really passionately that like Alex it should be this shot and not that shot and then we're going head to head and having this argument when I can summon the power to pause and say just for fun I'm going to assume that I'm wrong and assume that the other person is right and try to see it from their perspective. More often than not, I am able to, if nothing else, communicate better with them because I understand, well, he's seeing this idea that I'm putting forth from this perspective and in this framing. And for him, it's this kind of disaster scenario because it's actually what I'm proposing here has this negative effect somewhere else. And that's the thing that he's actually concerned about. And then once we're able to identify, oh, okay, you're actually worried about this thing. So why don't we go and talk about that thing? And then we fix that. And then the problem that's in front of us suddenly isn't a problem anymore. Yeah. No, so I, I hope that makes sense. But it, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's an advantage that creative fields and, and I don't want to paint it because I'm sure well, you and I both know every field's got its issues, right? But uh, but creative fields have over science-based fields. You know, if you look at where I started in strength and conditioning, it's so research-based that people, instead of assuming, taking out, well, let's assume I'm wrong approach, they're so desperate to be right. You know, somebody would put some research online, you know, and then somebody spends their entire day trying to find research that shows that that's wrong. I mean, and, and it's, it's very much this fetishization of, hey, I'm trying to be right, and I'm going to show you the research done in this part of the way. And it's like, all right, you know, relax. I remember one time in particular, because, again, I hope this continues to contribute to the conversation we have and us uh, seeing the similarities of what we do. I, I was one time working with a, a special forces operator who was an amputee. And he was being put through a program where the government, had, you know, was paying for him to get strength and conditioning uh, based training in order to rehabilitate. And so he could kind of go on to have somewhat of a normal life, you know, after he experienced this traumatic injury. And we were using a particular exercise. It doesn't matter for the context of this conversation what it was. And, you know, uh, somebody had seen a photo of it or what have you on social media and was like, well, that's not as effective as this. Here's next thing you know, I had three links of the research article. And I said, yo, like, this guy is an amputee. He's an adaptive athlete. Now he, 
what you sent makes no difference whatsoever because he can't perform that based on his injury. Like, are you mm -hmm. seeing things, right? But like, we get so caught up in wanting to be right about something that people don't take that assumed to be wrong. And uh, it, it's easy in a day and age where you can make data. It's funny, like, just like film has sometimes an over-reliance on CGI and other things, uh, science-based fields, when they look at data that essentially in today's day and age can say whatever you want it to say or not want it to say, it's just the antithesis of looking at things big picture, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you told a story once on one of your interviews that I loved where uh, you had talked about one of the ways that you had worked through creative blocks, and, and I would imagine this is just personality blocks as well or conflict, is you creating a lot of short films under constraints, right? And constraints, my audience understands that because when we teach athletes agility, they have to, you know, cut a certain way based on a certain command or a stimulus response, right? Um, and constraints in daily life. So I think you use an example of, hey, you have to do this in this scene, but you have to say, I love you. Or somebody has to do this in this scene and say something else. And the audience could even submit constraints. And because of that, it made you look beyond yourself and the situation and the environment of the moment and have an output that was useful instead of just sitting there in your own head. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the role that constraints play in the, your life and the value of your work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so one of the projects that Alex and I worked on about 10 years ago is this series of short films that we uh, did called Finite Films, where we would we were going to release a short film every month, and the audience could come and submit constraints that were just these one word or, or one sentence um, character-based things, location things, like one character loves olives, or one scene must take place in the rain. And that idea came to us because we were trying to come up with new ideas for stories. And, you know, when you're writing and you sit down and there's a big blank page, it can be overwhelming or, you know, you can start it going a direction and then halfway through realize, actually, no, I want to go this way. And you, just, you can end up all over the place. And so having constraints is actually what activates creativity so when you have these certain walls around you and it's like well you can't go over there and you can't go over there now you have to make a good story that it suddenly becomes fun it becomes almost like a, a puzzle um and so constraints are very important to the creative process i think like i think someone used the example of like painting like the frame of a painting like the canvas is your constraint you have to do something within these borders and that's that's kind of what the constraints are almost what gives the project meaning. Um, and so I think what that year-long process of making those short films taught us was to embrace constraints because I think that's another, you know, I always think about, again, film school, me, and all the things that aren't fun about creating at first. And, you know, the idea of like, well, you have to make something, it can only be this long and you, it has to take place here. At first that can sound limiting and you want to rebel against that. But now I see the value in creating those constraints and, and that activates um, the part of yourself that, that ultimately has the most fun. I think like that's, that's where you can create something that is of value to people and, and it challenges you to be better and that's how you improve. So constraints, I think, are a very important part of the creation process, um, whether that's writing or filmmaking, like whatever it is. And, and filmmaking itself is a medium that is just like filled with constraints because you can write a scene and hope it'll look one way, but then you get the set and maybe it's raining when it wasn't supposed to be. So now whether you wanted to or not, the scene takes place in the rain or the actor has one way of thinking about the scene and there's not enough time to change it, or maybe their idea is better, but that means something else has to change. So filmmaking in general, especially once you get on set requires so much flexibility and kind of, you know, thinking on your feet that I, I think it's, the, the entire process rewards um, practicing that idea of like things aren't perfect because they're never going to be perfect. So how good are you at making something that's compelling and meaningful to people when the situations aren't perfect? Yeah. Which I, I mean, I love, I mean, I, they shouldn't inhibit, they inspire. Right. And uh, again, going back right. to somebody that you put me on, Robert McKee, uh, there's a curse of the avant-garde 
that when people feel like they need all these things to do what they need to do when really they could facilitate it probably better within constraints and those constraints can be fairly minimal, they're better for doing so. You know, um, there were plenty of times where I had to coach in different countries or even when I speak now, like I might go and, you know, you, you imagine this place is going to have this set up because it's in the contract and all of a sudden they don't have audio and they don't have this. I mean, I went to China one time and they asked me if I had a projector. I'm like, you need me to have a projector. You got a thousand people in the crowd. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's funny and it, it goes <clears throat> hand in hand with like this idea of affordances as well, which is something we talk about in the world of sport performance where, you know, affordances are properties of objects that kind of show you uh, what you're supposed to do with it. Like light switches are for flicking. Well, if you have rain, I would have to imagine in filmmaking and, and it, it wasn't supposed to rain. Well, it's a pretty good opportunity to leverage the the rain or the gray sky for a dramatic shot that you might not have gotten otherwise. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's usually a silver lining to be found if you're creative with it. Yeah. And so uh, it's just, it's so funny from a cultural standpoint and profession standpoint, we see so we have these live workshops that when, you know, COVID is not a thing, go on with regularity. And they're, they're called the Art of Coaching Apprenticeship. And we have people from a wide variety of fields. We've had, we haven't had anybody from filmmaking, but we've had everybody from FBI and uh, the sport performance realm to somebody that owned a bakery to somebody that was in, you know, you name it, we have it. And, and we put them in role-playing type scenarios that are, of course, elevated, like, like improv would be, right? Like people often say, mm -hmm. well, improv is, is make-believe and it's not serious or they associate it with comedy. And we're like, well, actually, improv is pretty much everyday life. And, um, <laughs> you know, I remember one example that we did, Michael, is we told one coach that, hey, here, here's five people in front of you and we brought up actual folks from the audience. You have to explain this thing to, to each of them in five different ways. And here's Here's the archetypical behaviors they're going to employ. You know, one is one's a little manipulative and they're going to try to throw you off your game. One is highly skeptical. One is a novice and very excited about this. So you're going to have to manage their excitement in the moment. And I remember somebody stood up and they're like, well, this would never happen. And you just look at them and you're like, are you, you sure about that? You don't think you're ever going to explain things to a group of people and you're going to have varied responses and all, you know, how does your... How, and I, I know you can't speak for the entire field, but let's talk about your circle of friends or whoever you want to use an example. Is, is that stuff more widely accepted in, in filmmaking or do people still kind of sometimes need to be convinced and they almost feel too snobbish to allow themselves go down these creative paths where they have to deal with extemporaneous issues or problems? I think one of the things I, I like about filmmaking and the film community is that there is um, there is more of the acceptance that this kind of the improv and the imagining of what if scenarios like that's like, so well, that's what movies are, right? It's people that play dress up and pretend like something's happening and we record it and show it to people. Um, so I, that's one of the things that I, I think is really freeing about being in this sort of the, the drama space is that the people there are really, um, open to that and even like thrive and enjoy the idea of like, let's pretend that this is the situation that we're in and improvise and stuff. And I think that's, um, it, it is really valuable. And because as you're saying, like life is improvisation. And so having experience with that flexibility is really important. And I think it's, it's a great tool for discovery. Um, and like, yeah, I think kind of like you're saying, there's, I think there's more imagination in our daily lives than we are conscious of. Like, I think so, so many of our interpersonal relationships or fears that we have are these kind of stories that we're telling ourselves unconsciously, where it's like, you can be really afraid that this person's going to react this way. Or, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll have conversations in my head where I'm like, I'm worried about this note that I'm going to give this person and they're going to say this and then I'm going to have to say this and then who knows what's going to happen. There's this whole scenario that I've created in my head that is me assuming that's what's going to happen, but it isn't real, but it's affecting me and affecting my body as if it is real. And so I think doing things that, um, yeah, that, that flex your, your imagination muscles and your improvisation muscles are actually very useful in navigating life because so much of our experience is kind of created in our heads. Like at any given moment, there's very little that's around us that is completely real 
like or it's hard to explain but the things that we're that we carry around with us day to day whether it's about work and projects it's usually stuff that's either happened or is supposed to happen and is in the future and you know very little of it is tangible right in front of us and so so much of our experience is um yeah like navigating the story that we're kind of constantly weaving about ourselves and what's supposed to happen and what we're afraid of is going to happen and what we want to happen um so I think being just being having more awareness of that fact, I think, is is useful as a creative and just as a person living life. Yeah, that's it's well put. I think, um, you know, it's it's various forms of overload as well. Right. Like you I would imagine mm-hmm. certain people when they write themselves into a corner or, you know, sometimes and I got over it. You know, I, I guess at a point in my career, I'd view certain things as oh, that seems silly or to whatever. Now, now, when we run these workshops, I want people to give me impossible problems. You know, like I'm fine Mm -hmm. with you telling me something that is absolutely insane because then it makes any solution I come up with even that much more satisfying because people will try to get really clever. And I know that you've (laughs) done some stuff in improv in the past too. And it's, it actually kind of works against them because the more clever people try to get, the more obvious the answer becomes, at least when you're used to dealing Mm -hmm. with these things. Um, Uh but I'll, I'll never forget when I had to tell a coach, I go, listen, like, you know, the, the more ridiculous or unrealistic the constraint, the better, because that makes you think, I go, you do the same thing with athletes. We put 400 pounds on, on guys' backs because it can help them be faster or more explosive over time. Again, as long as the other aspects of their training are well-managed, like these people are lifting weights that no rational person would ever think outside of our context is, is going to do anything beneficial, but that's overload in the moment to facilitate an adaptation down the road. And yet you get people that depending on how they feel about themselves won't submit to their own variation of constraints. We have, we Mm -hmm. have coaches or folks that will do whatever to put themselves in uncomfortable situations from a physiological standpoint, but interpersonal, no way, you know? And that's why I, again, I want to draw attention to your work. Uh, we were talking off screen about one of the ways that I found you was your video creating the ultimate antagonist where you analyze, you know, Christopher Nolan's dark Knight, Um, and, I just remember, you know, the the Joker being this representation of chaos and the film really being rooted in game theory, right? Like this, there's this uncertainty Mm. and uh, it's this decision making where it's not both sides don't always really know what they're going to do, except the Joker knows he's going to leverage that one rule. Man, if your one rule is you'll never be willing to make yourself look stupid. And I'm not talking about Batman here. I'm talking about people that have pride. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're never going to be able to become what you need to become to be most effective in the con in in that moment. Right. In in that you'll never be the dark night. Like people get so caught up in what they're supposed to be, whether that's the proliferation of morning routines or they need to be this perfect. It's like, well, good luck because constraints reveal character to a degree. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the, the main lesson in that video and and that I think the dark night movie exemplifies so well is that, you know, character is the choice you make under pressure. And it's a choice that's, as you, as you pointed out, there's, you don't know the outcome. So there's this dilemma that's in front of you and there are two, two choices. None of them are clearly the right one. So what do you choose kind of, you know, and storytelling anyway, especially reveals character and it lets the audience know who this person really is. And I, I think the, the the analogy that ju- you just made is like s- really useful and I think something that's kind of been amorphous in my head but hearing you kind of say it is, has been really helpful where it's like you know your example of people that are willing to push themselves you know physiologically to these crazy places where it's like you know the example you gave of someone standing up and saying that would never happen in this other situation like you would never usually need to carry 400 pounds on your back in normal everyday life but trying that makes you stronger it gives you experience of what it's like to have to deal with a problem like that and i think we are very willing for some reason to take those risks in certain contexts but especially in these interpersonal contexts it's it's scarier and you feel more vulnerable but i feel like that's that's why those are the places that you should be taking those risks. And, you know, to bring it back to kind of like the writing creative side of things, I think it's, 
you know, especially when you're starting out as a writer, you can write a story and probably a lot of yourself is in there. So you feel very vulnerable and exposed. It's a very personal story. And getting feedback on that can be a really scary thing because you put all this love and you kind of like your identity is in the story. And so if you show it to someone and they say, well, that's kind of terrible, like that one part is fine, but overall this didn't work. There's a problem here and problem there. It's this kind of crisis moment that is hard to navigate because it's it, it can feel like someone is attacking you. And so often the response is to get defensive or say, you know, well, what I was trying to do here is this, or you just don't get it because like you're not seeing this thing and you kind of try to defend it and explain to someone why they should be seeing it the way you see it. But the discipline is to get comfortable in that that feeling of vulnerable, take those notes and then say, now I have information to go back and do it better. And that's, it, it requires diving into this very scary, vulnerable uh, state of mind where it can feel like your identity is being attacked, but that's how you get stronger. And the more you do it, the less scary it becomes until you know, kind of on the other side, which is, I think, overall where where I am now, like, I look forward to feedback. And there's nothing I love more than crossing out big sections of my stories or my scripts and with like with red ink, because I know that, you know, whereas before I could see something like that as, you know, a loss or a failure. Now I understand that if I'm crossing it out, it means that I know that there's a better way to do it. And I'm on my way to doing it better. And so it's it's this really kind of intense psychological journey you have to go on and you have to accept this kind of this fear and vulnerability. But if you can, that's how you get stronger. And I think that's the really great storytellers uh, have have gone through that journey and understand that that's just the process. And that that's what lets you create something where ultimately you are putting yourself into it and it's important to you, but it's also communicated to other people such that it's important to them as well. Yeah, no, very relevant, very relevant in many ways where, you know, master one of our mottos and it's not original at all, but like we just talk about respecting the craft and coaching and, and what have you. And, and we help people or we're trying to get people to understand that getting to that level, like you said, where you are just, uh, it, it's, you understand that failure revisions, refinement is part and parcel with growth. And really until you're there, it's, it, you, you, you're not a craftsman. I'm sorry. You're still in that. And you're always going to be an apprentice, right? Like that Hemingway quote, we're all apprentices in a craft. We were, we never become a master, but I'll, I remember one thing relating it to film is, uh, I mean, I'm sure I, I can't believe I'm going to ask you this question, but you've seen the movie, the hurricane. Yes. With Denzel Washington, or have you ever heard of it? Uh, yeah, I, I have seen it a long time ago. I don't remember. Right yeah, no, no. I, well, I just, where I'm going with this is that was a very impactful movie for me. I went to see it with my mother when I was uh, maybe 14 or 15, if there's a fact checker out there where I wrote this in my book, you know, whatever. But uh, it was about Reuben Hurricane Carter, a boxer that was wrongfully accused. Um, and, you know, for racial issues, what have you, ended up spending a significant amount of time in prison, wrote a book when he was in prison. And, you know, somebody in the context of the movie, uh, a kid had found his book. Uh, I think he was a foster child of a young Canadian family or what have you, read the book and then convinced his caretakers like, we got to free this guy. And so I remember it diving into the deep uh, personal nature of this man who is imprisoned and harbors all this anger and everything, and he's got to figure out an outlet for it. And because he was able to tell his story in a unique way that connected with somebody external through all these events, right? And I won't give it away, but uh, maybe it's a future project of yours. I remember <laughs> leaving there and I was 14 years old and I was in tears and my mom's like, what are you crying about? It's not like a, you know, and, and I go, I need to do something with my life. I was like a super serious mm. kid. But um, I ended up, you know, having some health complications later in life where I was hospitalized for a year. And that led me to writing a book where I share that journey. And I can't tell you, I mean, in, in my field, that was anathema. Like, you don't admit stuff like that, you know. But once I did and put it out there, this thing that I was ashamed of for like 16 years, people started coming out of the woodwork and be like, dude, you know, their own variations of a similar story. And I think that's where, you know, early on, I looked at training as a tool to teach other people what they're capable of. But now I look at it as, you know, communication, coaching, failure, refinement, self-analysis, and all this 
uh, exposing yourself to that uncertainty is the best tool to teach people what they're capable of. And during a time where it's so easy to wrap yourself in, I don't know, you know, continuing education resources that are affirmation based instead of education, especially mm-hmm. education of self. It's just, we've lost that. We've lost that act and, and, and people don't get into that enough, even though it's like, Hey, your expertise has nothing to do with your years of experience. It has to do more with how many layers of your skin are you willing to peel back so that you can keep growing with, does that make sense? Is that is that a lucid thought at all in the context of how your work? Yeah, no, 100%. I think that's that's super important. And I think that the movies that I love are movies that just tell the truth like that because I, I think that is, that's the scariest thing. Like we, we kind of think of bravery and there's sort of these external embodiments or images that we think of as like being bravery and, and or being brave. And I think that's all like true and valid, but there's, I I think the like true courage is being able to expose the truth about yourself or tell the truth that people are uncomfortable hearing. And I think that's, you know, I talk a lot about the movie Inside Out, the Pixar animated film, and I, I love it because it's, it's this kind of rare movie that has this message where like it's okay to be sad it's just like this you know in our society we're all about like we've got to be happy and successful and like there's a way that you should be and the important lesson in that movie is that like sadness is part of life also and that's okay and that always just strikes me as being so powerful because you know that's we we don't have a whole lot of that of in our media or in our culture of saying like it's okay to not be perfect all the time it's okay to fail it's okay to be afraid like these are all parts of the human experience and they are what make you stronger and better and let you connect to people and that connection is what you know we all like want and ultimately what makes us feel fulfilled in life and so i think that's that's what i love about film and stories is that when they're done really well they can be this kind of um for the storyteller it's a very vulnerable scary thing to put yourself out there in that way and expose yourself like that but it's this also kind of a generous thing that then you know i can sit in a theater usually not this year but i can sit in a theater with a couple hundred people and we all can go in with our guards up and we're just trying to live our day-to-day lives but we get this message of it's okay to be yourself and it's okay to, uh, yeah, be afraid and be sad. And like, that's part of life. And there's, it's just, it's a, a little nugget of truth that I think makes people that can enrich people's lives and it's, it, they can receive it without having to put themselves out there. And so I think that's storytelling at its best can be this very generous thing. We are letting people, go on this emotional experience and learn an important lesson without having to put themselves at risk. Yeah. uh, No, I don't to experience it. There are a lot of questions I want to ask with that. And I also want to be conscious of your time. Um, so I'm going to have to like figure out how to, I feel like we could talk for quite a while. Uh, (laughs) one thing that has continued to hook me about your work and this is related to what you said, just give me a moment to try to formulate this, right? Is <laughs> sure. you get the essence of both how you communicate, uh, the words you use, the tonality, the cadence, there's an essence of calmness about it, whether that is something you work on or not, I'm fascinated in. Um, but from the background music as well, you get this feeling like you're in good hands, like your videos during one of the most stressful years of my life are obscenely calming to the point where I started watching them at breakfast. And my wife's like, well, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm like, listen, um, I know you like the Today Show and shit, but this dude, like, it, it kind of puts me in the zone that I need to be in. Um, so I'm, I'm fast. One, I just want to give you that compliment. Accept that. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going awesome to hear. I'm going to risk something here real quick. I, I'm generally pretty good at reading people, but I'm wrong often as well the level of introspection and the tone and some of the themes you explore connotate that you are somebody that is either deeply introspective, which we've explored. You're an, you're an only child, at least for the the most part or what have you, but is there something that you've, and I know everybody's got their thing, but is there some darkness that you deal with or have dealt with in your life that really kind of helped hasten this process of self-exploration recognition of higher order themes 
is there an inner demon, so to speak, that, you know, provides that added perspective? Because I, I feel like it's not all that common uh, for somebody to explore the things that you explore and the way that you explore them. It's like you have a very unique language of your own. So that's, it's not a well-formed no. question, but I just want to know, is there something there? Uh, I think example would be, I can come off as a fairly intense person if you meet me. That comes from me having almost lost my life at a young age, seeing a lot of family members pass. I have this urgency to me and, and it can work against me and for me. I guess that's what I mean. Is there any kind of inner demon that compels you one way or another or informs the way you interact or craft things? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, first of all, thank you. That's, that was all very flattering. And as a creator, it's amazing to hear people, you know, are moved by your work. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like everyone does uh, have, you know, some you know, in storytelling terms, it's often called like the ghost, which is, you know, the, the traumatic incident in the past that kind of explains why someone has the fears that they do. Um, you know, there's nothing like that's so like, uh, you know, clear and easy to point to, I think, in my life, because I've had a, a pretty amazing life. I've been pretty privileged. And um, so, yeah, it's kind of like on paper, I feel like there's nothing I should ever be, uh, you know, upset about. Um, but I do think, and I think this is maybe why uh, I like Inside Out and why it speaks to me, is that I think as a child, I was a very emotional child. And I think I was just, you know, my imagination, but also just in tune with my feelings a lot and kind of wore my heart on my sleeve. And uh, that's generally not in our culture. And I think it's changing, but you know, not like a manly way to exist in the world. And I think especially like in middle school and high school, that was uh, a hard thing for me to navigate. And most of my friends were girls and I actually just related more to girls because I felt like I could be more of my honest self. And then kind of in high school and early college, like kind of eventually that was beat out of me a little bit like that's maybe a, a an unnecessarily strong way to say it because I think I still am that person but you just you kind of learn this is like the way culture expects you to be and how to navigate all these things and so I think I didn't lose those parts of myself but I did have to kind of repress them or put them away and and just like I think any teenager also that wears your heart on your sleeve eventually it's going to get broken and then you kind of build up your defense mechanisms around that. And so I think I have always been a very introspective person and, um, yeah, very in touch with emotions. And I think it's helped me be empathetic because I think that's, that's now, I think how I mostly feel things is, is through empathy and watching other people experience things like tragedies can happen to me and it sucks, but I don't feel it the same way as when I see somebody else like going through a tragedy. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, somewhere in all of that is probably that this this you know to be in a, a it's, it's almost just like the loss of childhoodness like becoming an adult having to leave behind uh um, emotions and just like the i don't know the ability to be yourself and that it's okay to be whatever you are um i think that's uh yeah i i, I like stories now that have that message of like, it's okay to be you and we need more people that can just be themselves. And, and I think that, as I was saying earlier, that vulnerability is what lets us connect to people because everyone has an inner self that they're kind of guarding or, or afraid to let too many people see. And I think you have to in order to form meaningful connections. And so, like I said, I think storytelling is a way to kind of create that that bridge for people to let themselves slowly be vulnerable or indirectly connect about you know you go see the movie maybe you and your friend both cry but like you don't have to talk about it you don't have to look at each other while you're crying it's just like yeah this we both had this experience and we can talk about it as this other thing but it's it's letting you connect in that way and i think that's what story can storytelling can do at its best yeah very well put um do you have, and it's okay to say no, do you have time for three more questions? And one of them is a softball. So like, you know, you don't have to worry <laughs> if I'm going to ask you something that's going to 
Yeah, sure. you're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me think of how I'll give you the soft one uh, first, just because you reference inside out and appreciate this theme of, you know, sadness and it's okay. You know, very much in, in our work at Art of Coaching, we're trying to be the anti kind of rah, rah leadership thing, right? This thing that also tells like, yeah, there, mm. we, we're all aware of the bright side of, of what traditional leadership looks like. We've heard innumerable examples, uh, but there's also dark side, right? These socially, socially undesirable traits that get typecast and, and could be hallmarked by words like manipulation and influence and um, power dynamics and what have you, which really aren't bad. They're only bad if they're, uh, you know, not wielded appropriately or not recognized. To that point, mm-hmm. just because they tend to get typecasted as the villain and the villain doesn't always get their due, who is one of your favorite villains in film? And it can be animated or it can be in general. Who, who do you think is a representative of something that's, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it vague. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. <laughs> and don't feel pressure to have like your number one. I know that's, that's always tricky. It sure. doesn't have to be your number one, just one that you really feel like, yeah, this is a great villain. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird. Cause I think in film, there's sort of like there's villains, which are usually like clearly like the bad people and represent what you shouldn't be. And I think I really like stories where um, there are antagonists, but not necessarily villains. And so this is uh, kind of, or just like, you know, um, Collateral is a movie I think about a lot with Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx, where uh, Tom Cruise is kind of like the villain in that story. But yeah, it's, he's, I think I like stories where the antagonist is used to teach the protagonist how to live better where there's like something in, if you think about that movie, Tom Cruise is too far on the side of like hyper confidence and hyper cool and like all this stuff. Like he's a hit man. Like that's obviously bad, but in this night that the two of them spend together, he's kind of slowly brings Jamie Foxx out of the other end of the spectrum where he's so afraid to do anything that he does nothing with his life, even though he has all these dreams. And so that model of antagonist I always like where it's there's that person is still a human and there are parts of them that is good because everybody is complex, but it's just, they've taken it too far or are are unwilling to let go of the piece that makes it, you know, a a negative manifestation of these traits. And so it, it makes the protagonist learn a better way to be and kind of draws them more to this middle area where you can see the good and bad and take the the useful parts of both ways of being. So yeah, the gray area, right? Which is ironic because he wears a gray suit in the majority of that film. I'm sure that's <laughs> right. Um, no, I, I, and I appreciate and that. you're right, and and it leads into something. I remember that scene where Jamie Fox eventually just has to step into this persona, right? Where he's confronted mm-hmm. by the you know the goons that are essentially like you're not this guy, and he has to step up and, and assert himself. It's interesting because in 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 coaching and leadership, another I think lie that we're told is, uh, you know, well, it's not about you, and it should be about others, and it's always serving others, and of course, you need to provide others with value. That's that's unquestionable, right? Like I don't, but I think there's also this immense narrative out there that if you do anything that is remotely perceived as self promotion or personal branding or what have you, that you're mm-hmm. a sellout and that it's evil and what have you, and I and I know. To a degree, these things can happen. I mean, I remember uh, Scorsese going on about, you know, all these Marvel movies and what have you. And and in coaching, it's very much the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I first got on social media, that was very much, no, you are not supposed to have this. Um, you know, as we step into different roles in our lives, how how have you navigated that, given yourself permission to be like, you know what, it's it's not bad to have a brand. It's not this, um, you know, is that anything that you ever struggled with? Did you ever just kind of want to stay in the background a little bit, but with the emergence of, you know, the popularity of lessons from the screenplay and what have you, you learned how to deal with, again, I want to make sure I'm asking a clear question, but also leaving it open-ended. Uh, how have you addressed this kind of concept of staying true to the craft while not selling out while not being apologetic for building a brand? (laughs) Right. Yeah, I mean, I think you lay it out well where it is this very tricky thing to navigate. Um, I think if if you're someone who can see where people are coming from when they're annoyed by 
you know, quote unquote selling out. Right. And so like if, if you're an artist, I feel like there's a lot of that built in of like you want to be true to your art and all that stuff. But you have to sell it to a certain degree or else you're not going to be able to make the art. And so how do you walk that balance? Um, uh, I, I think I, in creating the channel, kind of designed it so that it didn't feel like it was about me that much. Like I don't really appear on screen in the videos except at the very end to talk to the audience and say what's coming up next and stuff. Um, and so I, I was very conscious of all of that when designing it and, you know, had followed other YouTubers and heard kind of their experiences with all of that. And so I think that's why I tried to craft the brand around the the work and the analysis as much as possible and not as much about me as a personality. And so I think that kind of helped me feel comfortable promoting it because it didn't feel as much like promoting myself, even though it is essentially. And so that's, that's kind of how I navigated it. Um, but I, you know, there's the world of social media is this whole, I mean, that's a can of worms that we probably shouldn't get too much into, but it, it does reward personality based, um, you, you know, brands, uh, in a, in a way that is basically, I think if I had put myself in the, in the brand and put that more forward, I think I could have grown faster and I think even on Twitter, like the more emotional you are when you're tweeting and saying like, I hate this or I love this, it's easier for people to like latch on to. And so I wasn't super interested in doing any of that. So I avoided that. But it is also kind of shooting yourself in the foot when doing it. So it's it's a hard thing to navigate. Yeah, sure. no, it's very relatable. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, on you, there were plenty of people that told me, oh, you should do YouTube and this. And, but for the type of content we produce, that's not a great medium to express that, right? Like I could show, sure mm -hmm. I could show myself like, Hey, here's how you manage this group of athletes or here's how you manage it. Like that's not as interesting as seeing it in real time and experiencing it in real time. And so it takes a while to find your medium too, right? Like, um, yeah. I knew if I stayed on the athlete training side, of course, like we're going to see certain mediums take off. But now that I've shifted more into nuances of interpersonal communication, teaching about how to navigate power dynamics and personality, you know, that typically is done fairly well over the podcast or our online courses or our books or our live events. So people need to find their fit too, don't they? Almost like uh, yeah. the idea of genre. It's like not, you don't need to be everywhere. You need to pick and choose and then not worry about following the narrative of everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I think that's really smart advice. And that's, and that was one of the things that I kind of unexpectedly found when we launched our podcast beyond the screenplay was that I, I felt comfortable letting my personality kind of expose itself more there. Like it felt like a safer space in some ways than film YouTube, which can also turn toxic very quickly. So I think, yeah, choosing, choosing the right format for what you're trying to do is, is very important. And within that, Michael, and, and then, uh, you know, again, I can't tell people enough that if you haven't already subscribed to everything Michael does, Lessons from the Screenplay. I've subscribed to your podcast as well. I could care less who you interview. Again, it's all just fascinating storytelling, story mode, what have you. Within all these projects, and we'll continue to share, we'll definitely share the links, what have you learned about yourself as a communicator? It's a good question. I think I have realized that for whatever reason, my life experience has led me to this place where I seem to be good at distilling ideas down into an audio visual form that can be conveyed clearly and simply to people. And that's, that's my goal anyway. And I think it's, um, I like that about myself. If I can, yeah, again, just throw out the humbleness for a second, but that's, I think it's a hard thing to, come by and it's a hard thing to do and so I feel gratified when I'm able to do it or when people you know give that feedback of like oh this was made so clear and I or it's so soothing and it's relaxing to like that's it's very fulfilling to me because that's something I want to see more of in the world and so to be able to contribute to that at least a little bit is is nice so I think that's uh, yeah, 
I, I think that's, I guess, what I've learned about myself. Yeah, you nailed it, man. Well, tell everybody everywhere, links and all, where can we support you? How can we find you? Rock and roll. Go with it. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so on YouTube, I have two channels. Lessons from the Screenplay is the one that's been going for four, going on five years now. Um, that's all about film analysis. And then also on YouTube, I've just launched a new channel called Story Mode which is looking at uh, storytelling in video games. And there's a lot of really interesting overlaps with film and video games, but also it's this kind of new medium that can affect the player in a a really interesting way. So I'm really excited about that. So Lessons from the Screenplay and Story Mode are on YouTube. And then we have our podcast, Beyond the Screenplay, which is where the team that I've formed over the last couple of years, and it's the same team that works on Lessons from the Screenplay and Story Mode, we do like conversational film analysis. So it's kind of like a, a slightly more casual and longer form way of talking about movies that we love and what they do well and what they don't do well. So Beyond the Screenplay, available wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and we will make sure you pause for a moment there. We'll make sure and we'll have those available in the show notes everywhere. Michael, I think, uh, man, there's there's a lot I'd like to continue to talk to you about. So I hope we keep in touch. I hope the show challenged you and also made you feel welcomed and supported at the same time. I, I can't tell you enough Absolutely. how grateful I am for you accepting the invitation of a stranger, man. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you so much. This was a, a very fun conversation and, and I appreciate it. All, all the places that we went and I, I appreciate your generosity and thoughtfulness with, with how you run all of it. So thank you. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Guys, this is Brett Bartholomew, Art of Coaching Podcast, signing off.